Welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Joe Capizzi at the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America. I'm really pleased you guys have joined us this afternoon. We have a great turnout uh, of people um, who are listening and watching uh, uh, our conversation. It's really a special conversation for us, in part because we welcome back uh, a regular IHE fellow and friend of ours, uh, Dr. Adrian Walker. Um, and he's gonna be joined today um, by two other panelists as we discuss the role of the thematic in politics and in particular in the sort of victimology uh, that is a, a kind of characteristic feature of contemporary political and social um, life uh, in general and also of course of our discourse as well. Let me introduce uh, the people who will be speaking to us today. First, I'm going to introduce uh, Mark Schiffman Mark is going to go first today. He's gonna to, uh, sort of lead off our conversation and he'll be followed by Matt and then by Adrian. Uh, and then we'll have a conversation among ourselves. And then of course, I'll open it up uh, to allow you guys to ask some questions too. Mark is an associate professor in the Department of Humanities at Villanova University. He's a scholar of ancient philosophy who has published studies of Plato, Aristotle, and Plutarch, and has translated Aristotle's De Anima, he is also interested in the inter interconnected history of philosophy, theology, and social and political thought. His publications include studies of a variety of figures from Virgil and Augustine to Wendell Berry and Pope Francis, as well as articles in Commonweal, First Things, and Communio. Matt Crawford um, is an author and uh, uh, he earned his PhD from the University of Chicago. He's probably best known for his book, Shop Class as Soulcraft, which I believe came out um, around 2009. Uh, but since then, he's written at least two books um, that I'm aware of. One of them is The World Beyond Your Head. I think that was 2015. Uh, and then the second is Why We Drive Towards the Philosophy of the Open Road, um, which came out just a couple of years ago. Um, so that's Matt. Adrian Walker, as I said, is a good friend of ours. I'm actually checking my phone now because he texted me his bio, um, which is in some ways very Adrian, but in other ways, you know, kind of keeping me on my toes. Uh, in addition to being a fellow at the Institute and a former colleague of ours at Catholic University, Adrian now teaches theology and philosophy at St. Patrick's Seminary and University in Menlo, Menlo Park, California. Okay, th those are our panelists. Uh, again, thank you guys for joining us. We'll have our conversation and then we'll invite everybody to uh, pose some questions. I'll select those questions and read them to, uh, to the panelists and uh, we'll have a kind of lively conversation. Great. All right, Mark, you're up. Thank you. Well, thank you, Joe. And thanks uh, everyone for um, <clears throat> uh, both uh, the organizers and, and uh Fellow panelists and uh, and everyone who's uh, who's shown up to be in on the conversation. Uh, and I just want to say at the outset that um, having this on Ash Wednesday was Adrian's idea. <clears throat> so uh, you know anyone who's who's hungry and grumpy, you can blame Adrian. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, but it does give me what I hope will be um, an interesting uh, opening gambit. Uh, which is, I want to talk about uh, Lent and fasting for a second um, and, uh, and different ways that we think about it. And this, uh, if you'll bear with me, will get us sort of in the direction of our topic. Um, so uh, I'm just let me get my timer going here so I know how long I'm talking. Um, so uh, one way of thinking of fasting particularly is as a kind of self-denial, right? A kind of reining in of our appetites uh, that we normally kind of, you know, let take their course with, you know, not a whole lot of attention. Uh, and this, of course, is a very uh, negative way of thinking about it in terms of privation. <clears throat> um, but that privation uh, should serve a purpose, right? And one way of thinking about the purpose of fasting, particularly during Lent, is that it requires us to be more conscious about the choices that we make that usually we make unreflectively or habitually, right? Uh, of how we invest our time and our energies uh, in, in things, in, uh, in about what we prioritize, or in other words, um, <clears throat> making rationally explicit the order of goods that guide our choices in a way that we uh, often just let happen uh, habitually. Um, and ultimately, uh, 
usually in terms of Lent and discipline, that's thought about uh, as making a kind of room for, for, uh, for prayer and for greater mindfulness. Right? Now, if we think about these two ways of, of looking at it, um, these two aspects of it, uh, and if we think about them in terms of the Platonic psychology, that is one of the bedrock um, ideas in, in Christian thought, both Catholic and Orthodox, uh, in the long tradition, uh, these ways of thinking about it are, are viewed primarily in terms of appetite and rational consciousness, right? Um, and that, uh, and thinking in those terms, uh, reason and appetite, uh, is of course a very familiar model of agency for us, right? Uh, according to modern economic theory and practice, right? The rational choice, according to modern political theory, liberal political theory, particularly uh, self-interested uh, rational actors <clears throat> is what we think of ourselves as being. But of course, as, as I said, we talk about this, uh, this fasting also as Lenten discipline among other Lenten disciplines. And what is discipline? Well, this gets us more to our topic, right? Discipline is the capacity to choose a course of action and commit to it regardless of the prompting of any desires to the contrary. <clears throat> and this is where the third part of the soul, thumos, or the irascible part in the Latin-speaking tradition, uh, plays the central role as something distinct from appetite and reason, <clears throat> right? Uh, and these distinctions are first made uh, explicit uh, in, as, as a, a psychology in Plato's Republic. And the, uh, the thematic uh, part of the soul first comes to light in the Republic precisely in terms of self-command, right? Uh, in terms of the appetites being submitted, uh, subjected to rational judgment. Uh, so one manifestation then is moderation, right? <clears throat> uh, but also courage, of course, right? Courage, which requires that our fear of death itself be subordinated to commitment to facing danger on the basis of some principle of choice that we're committed to. Right? Uh, and to come back to fasting in a sense uh, that it, it, it lands somewhere between moderation and courage, right? Because it's, um, it's uh, not only ignoring uh, excessive desires, but even ignoring the desires that are naturally there to keep us alive. Right? And so in some sense, it ultimately points toward a freedom from anxiety about death. And of course, the ashes uh, that are part of the Ash Wednesday uh, liturgy are a reminder of that. But the, the sort of death consciousness uh, involved here is ultimately fulfilled at the end of this process in the liturgy of the Passion and the Crucifixion. <clears throat> and this is a time liturgically in which Im we imaginatively give our attention to the violent suffering and death of Jesus who is a completely innocent victim. Right? <clears throat> and, uh, and this uh, brings us to the, um, the, the sort of beginnings of the constellation of, of victimhood and thumos that I'm gonna try to uh, tease out a little more. Um, <clears throat> and the liturgy asks us not only to give attention to this victimization, uh, but also in a sense to voice our own complicity in it. Right, uh, the 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 um, congregation is supposed to say, "Crucify him, crucify him." Right, um, <clears throat> which is to say, it habituates us to a kind of self-aware check on our spirited tendency toward both violent scapegoating and mob rage. Right? Uh, and uh, and of course, Rene Girard has identified this kind of uh, this consciousness through this narrative of the passion and the crucifixion as a radical shift in Western consciousness uh, from what is previously a ubiquitous source of religion, right? A tendency to ritualize and mythologize the scapegoating violence for the sake of restoring and maintaining social cohesion. Now, why do I dwell on all this? Right? Well, as I say, because this, this constellation of spiritedness, victimization, and violence is, in one way or another, at the heart of our political order. Uh, but it's usually buried out of sight. <clears throat> but as we see all around us, victimological political rhetoric and the violent rage that it 
can justify uh, has really become a prominent feature in our social and political landscape uh, in the last decade or two, especially. And my contention is that to understand the political passions of our times and maybe also the prospects for the future of liberal democratic constitutional order, we have to understand two things especially. One is how this victimological imagination cultivated by Christian, uh, the Christian tradition gets secularized in early modern political thought. And that secularized victimology provides the primary principle of legitimation of the state. This is the case, especially in Thomas Hobbes. And then the second thing, how this, uh, this secular state based on secular victimology, legitimated by secular victimology, how this reshapes and rechannels the social and political expressions and manifestations of Thumos. And, uh, and for beginning to get a grip on this, uh, Hobbes' Leviathan really is the key text. All right, so, um, so I'm going to first talk about the secularized victimological imagination. Uh, if you recall Hobbes' State of Nature, right, those uh, who, who joined together to authorize the state and to authorize the state's monopoly on legitimate violence, as described by Weber, uh, those are the fearful victims of violence, right? The ones who want to not be preyed upon, right? <clears throat> And so our sympathy in this story is with the victims, which is a, uh, which is a result of what Girard is identifying as this, this great transformation uh, in, uh, in Western victim consciousness, right? Uh, the second thing I wanna do is read a short passage uh, from chapter 15 of Leviathan. I was just, just uh, kind of came to my attention vividly this morning. Um, so this is at the end, right? Hobbes is going through the various, uh, the various laws of nature, right? That is to say the various uh, principles that, um, that we should naturally affirm and ask the state to enforce in order to coexist with uh, peace and security. Um, he says, well, all this may be, you know, to seem too complicated, but to leave all men inexcusable, these laws of nature have been contracted into one easy sum intelligible even to the meanest capacity. And that is, do not that to another which thou wouldst not have done to thyself. Which showeth him that has no more to do, that he showeth him that he has no more to do in learning the laws of nature, but when weighing the actions of other men with his own, to put them into the other part of the balance and his own into their place that his own passions and self-love may add nothing to the weight. And then there's none of these laws of nature that will not appear unto him very reasonable, right? Which is to say, Hobbes here puts us actually through a victimological imagination exercise, right? Um, but all that this requires of us is a combination of self-interest, fear, and possibly a touch of indignation, but entirely on my own behalf, right? as the imagined victim in this scenario. So that's the first thing to notice, right? The, the victimological imagination, totally secularized, individualized um, in terms of the self. And then the second thing to notice about this passage is the negative formulation of the golden rule, right? <clears throat> the golden rule is not about what I am to do, but rather what I should willingly authorize the state to prevent everyone from doing. And as Tocqueville observes, right, in, in modern social conditions, right, democratic social, democratized social conditions, you might say, um, this is a danger that's ever present that the modern state will tend toward administrative centralization. And as he points out, administrative centralization is very good at preventing action for the sake of protection, right? And it's not at all good at encouraging or inspiring or motivating action on the part of citizens. Right? 
Um, and, you know, we come up with 100 examples uh, from the past couple of years uh, of that uh, manifesting itself. Now, in his recent book, Pierre Menon has reflected on this tendency of, modern, of the modern state to erode our capacity for action. This is his book, Natural Law and Human Rights. And in an earlier book, <clears throat> Metamorphoses of the City, uh, Manon notes how it is the polis itself, that is the political form of life, that originally makes action possible. All right, so there's a kind of, uh, kind of you know, bookends of a narrative here of the, the birth and death of action, <laughs> in a sense, in Manon, right? Uh, that is, prior to the emergence of the polis as a, as a form of communal life, uh, life is very heavily ritualized, right? And the in a certain way, the question, what should I do, almost never arises. What should I do, right? Uh, in very rare circumstances or very limited circumstances. And therefore, thumos, which is what attaches my me to a chosen action, course of action, tends to run in very well-worn tracks. Whereas in when the polis uh, exists and I live in that context, the question, what might I do and what might we do arises. Right? And therefore also the question, what should I do or what should we do? And therefore also the question, what is virtue, right? What is excellent action, uh, excellent character, which is <clears throat> the core question of Socratic political philosophy. So only then do we have action properly speaking. And Thumos then has a role in attaching one's own commitment to actions that are chosen from possible actions. And this is an important thing to, to bear in mind. So Hobbes is very consistent, right? When he asks us first to adopt this position of the victim of violence, and from that position to authorize the state to suppress the channeling of Thumos into things like pride and glory and violent domination, which are characteristic of aristocratic. Uh, Orders, right? And to rechannel Thumos into the bourgeois pursuit of the means of commodious living, as he puts it, and to conceive of rights as something the state protects for us on our behalf. Right? So there's a cooperative relationship then between the secular victimological legitimation of, of the state monopoly on violence and the decoupling of Thumos from action and virtue, rechanneling it to economic activity and to the and to uh, rechanneling our hopes to the state's action protecting us. Right? <clears throat> so, uh, very very briefly, uh, what happens subsequently to that um, is that uh, in the liberal tradition, properly speaking. Uh, ways of asserting Thumos get revived in new forms, right? And, uh, and one of the forms uh, that we see this currently taking is what we call identity politics. And I mean that uh, in versions that are on both the left and the right. So the left version is very familiar to us, right? Uh, and it, it manifests itself often in the policing of speech, right? We see this every day, right? <laughs> you just watch your newsfeed, right? But the policing of speech isn't just about conformity, right? It's not just about keeping people on a page you want them to be on. It's about using fear to prevent the frank speech that's necessary for citizens to cooperate in active self-government, right? To argue about what is to be done, what should we do, right? And thus it severs Thumos further from real action and from practical policies, right? And these, these positions very rarely have anything you could call a practical policy, right? Just, um, just uh, criticisms mainly, right? And, uh, and it channels then Thumos into a kind of performative political theater, right? And all of this legitimated on behalf of others who are victims, right? That is those who suffer oppression that is systemic and civilizational and institutional. Right. And this, uh, this uh, in, its, in its modern roots, is given shape by Rousseau, ultimately. Right. So there's a lot more to say about that. Uh, very briefly, then, the identity politics of the right, um, it, it takes a different form, right? <clears throat> Those who consider themselves victimized on the right, uh, certainly if we're looking at America especially, consider themselves victims of an overreaching state that suppresses liberties. 
especially through the imposition of a progressive agenda. And these victims are feisty, irascible patriots who are wary of and on the watch for uh, encroachments, right? They're ready to deny the state its monopoly on legitimate violence. <clears throat> and we see this, I think, best expressed in the don't tread on me uh, flag and motto, right? <clears throat> uh, and, this, and this is given its initial sort of full form in, uh, in Lockean uh, theory of rights, right? Rights as asserted of, over against the tyrant state, if necessary, right? So these two left and right victimologies have in common that they ground themselves on sources of legitimacy that are alternative to the actual regime, right? Uh, and represent alternative regimes, right? The, either the Republic of Armed Patriots right? or the egalitarian uh, society that's free from moral disapproval and, uh, and oppression. In both cases, what we see is a decoupling of the spirited passions from forms that sustain the liberal order and setting them loose to form alternative groups of legitimacy that rage at one another and tear apart the liberal order. And so finally, uh, I want to argue that this is the bringing to the surface of a secularized victimology that might itself ultimately be at the root of the problem, but has just been submerged because of the other sort of successful things that the liberal order has had going. And that this requires us to consider two things, uh, at least, right? One, how to think about political legitimacy in non-victimological terms, if we can do that. And secondly, how Thumos can be given healthier channels in which to exercise character forming action and self governing action that issues in a kind of responsible politics. And I'll just suggest as a last thought that perhaps the recovery of a properly Paschal imagination may be important to this. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark. Uh, very much for your comments. Uh, Matt, you're up next. Hey, well, thank you, Mark. This is so, um, so rich and there's so many threads um, that we could pick up and, and focus on. I, um, I, I'll just start kind of um, at random, you know, you began with a discussion of fasting and Lent, and this is a, a moment of where the, it seems like you could pose it as um, asserting one's freedom um, as against the appetite of part of the soul. And it isn't simply a rational, it's not that the food is um, contaminated, so I'm, it's a rational judgment that I shouldn't eat, but rather it's this spirited um, assertion of the dignity of, of the self. And, I was really struck by the um, the bit from Manon that you mentioned, where in uh, a primitive society before the arising of the polis, where life is highly ritualized, this moment of asking what should I do doesn't much arise, and that it's in political life of the polis that um, there's a more um, I don't know. I don't know if indeterminacy is the right word, but in any case, one's status as a moral agent comes to the fore. And when, when you said that, it made me think of our current COVID regime as a kind of regression to a highly ritualized, <laughs> more primitive kind of society, you know, with the hygiene theater. Um, it's... Well, let me just relate a personal experience. Um, my warrant for doing so is that Thumas, I think, is inherently tied to the individual and his status as, as a moral agent. So I, this was in July. I, my daughter was attending a soccer day camp. So every day I would drop her off. Um, so this is 10 kids running around an open field, and they're wearing masks the entire time. 
and it's you know 85 degrees you know just for like five or six hours and so telling my daughter to put on my fully vaccinated daughter to put on this mask i felt compromised for participating in the charade and i think it would be significant to try to understand these small moments of humiliation because i think that's what it is um in the context of the Habesian politics that you're talking about. Um, I think it's because, because we know, because everyone knows the irrationality of such rules, it's our status as rational beings that is being, um, we're being asked to kind of, um, that's, that's where the humiliation is, the fact that it's, it's invoking science uh, the reasoning part of the soul and which interacts with the thumatic part because thumas is what evaluates things. It places values on things and that's inherently involves the rational faculties. Any, so um, as, as you say, the Leviathan relies on fear to suppress pride and um, And I think when we play our part in this kind of hygiene theater or you know, security theater in the airport where we you know, have a kind of rational understanding of the inefficacy of it, we're suffering the unique humiliation of a rational being who submits to these moments of social control that he knows to be founded upon untruths. Um, so, that's one, I think, massive way in which the problem you're articulating um, manifests in day-to-day in -day life. And what you've done, I think, is shown the pedigree of, um, of this in deep in, in liberal thought. In a sense, it's a kind of victimology that we're living out now in this sense. One, when a certain kind of subject is required of the COVID regime where one regards oneself as vulnerable and uh, fragile. And so, um, the, uh, that moment of what should I do is kind of suppressed because mere biological life is kind of elevated to a status of um, a moral imperative, mm -hmm. which tends to efface um, action and, and choice. And, and there's the literal effacing of, you know, by putting on the mask and somehow the face is, um, I wanna say is sort of connected to the, the uh, is that, I mean, the, the breath and the heart are the seat of Thumas in the classical um, account, right? But the face also is somehow where the, individ the individual shines forth and we're being asked to, to cover the face. Um, and this seems uh, deeply implicated in the sort of arresting or short circuiting of our evaluative um, capacities to, um, I don't know, respond to the situation with our full panoply of faculties as um, evaluative creatures. I don't know. I'll stop there. I'm kind of uh, going on. Good. Thanks. All right, Adrian, you're up. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, no, thanks for both uh, of those interventions. Both of them were very rich and very suggestive and both leave me with the difficulty of knowing exactly where to start. One thing that I, I would like to propose for further reflection uh, would be, let's say the, the sort of Christian, the possibility of a Christian valorization of the thumotic. Um, so the, the thumatic is something beautiful, um, also insofar as it 
has to do, as both Mark and Matt said, with a kind of appropriation of one's action. Um, but, it, but it's also, as we know, it's also dangerous um, precisely because it's, in addition to being powerful, beautiful, very powerful. Um, so there's something dangerous about it. And, and uh, we're all familiar with the, with what happens when the danger is succumbed to, you know, um, everybody talks about violence and so forth. Um, and so the, the, the danger of the thematic um, can sort of maybe lead, lead us Christians as well to want to just eliminate it as much as possible from, from our lives. Um, but it seems to me that that would be a profound mistake for many reasons, some of which were uh, at least indirectly stated in the last two interventions, but, but also because uh, I think the thematic plays a role in the life of Christ himself. Um, so it's, it's true that Christ is in one sense a victim, right? We, we say victima pascale, Pascali, right? Um, or Pascalis, I guess it would be the Paschal victim. Right. But, but he's also the one who offers himself. Um, it said in John's, he says in John's gospel, for example, um, no one snatches my life from me. I have the authority to lay it down and to take it up again. Um, and it seems to me that that authority, the exercise of that authority could be looked on, could be looked at among other things as a sort of hyperbolic fulfillment of um, the, the role of the thematic in, in establishing self-command. Um, and at the same time, it's also a hyperbolic fulfillment of the way in which I think the, the sort of thematic moment of taking possession of one's, of appropriating one's action um, and sort of standing forth with, with a kind of glory as oneself um, is, is also intimately bound up with, with love of the good, with love of the beautiful. Um, because in, in that same passage in John's gospel, the Lord says, um, and I, I'm not going to be, quoting it exactly right, but, but, but the, the sense of the, the sort of, of what comes immediately after the words that I just cited is that uh, um, it's the father who gives him the authority to lay down his life and take it up again. So there's a kind of, you know, we have this sort of hyperbolic fulfillment of Thumas as a, in its role as, as establishing self-command and sort of standing forth in a kind of glory. Um, and we also have the hyperbolic fulfillment of the way in which that Thumas, um, that thematic role is bound up with love of the beautiful, love of the good, which in this case is um, love of the father and of his goodness, which is something that, again, in John's gospel, Christ says over and over again, he watches, he sees the father. Um, and in fact, in, in laying down his life with it, with in this, this sort of glorious mixture of uh, thumas and kind of obedient love of the beautiful, Christ actually makes present the, the self-giving authority of the father. So I'll just, I'll just stop there. I mean, there, I, there, there's so much that both Matt, Matt and, 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 and Mark said that um, I'm sure we'll have at least a little bit of time to, to develop. The, the only thing is I, I have to move locations because I'm already almost out of juice. So for, forgive me for doing this, but uh, I just have to move over here so that I can, I can uh, 
plug in my computer and avoid an even greater embarrassment. No, that's okay. Thank you, Adrian, for your comments. Okay, so, you know, like, like the, the two of you guys have said, Matt and Adrian, there's a lot on the table, um, right? There's a, there's a whole bunch of stuff on the table. And uh, if you all don't mind, I would like to sort of go back just a little bit and perhaps sure. establish um, a kind of launching point by asking a question first for Mark, but really I think, you know, you guys are all welcome to intervene on it. Mark, you began by basically defining thumos for everybody as a sort of third part of the soul, you know, speaking of rational consciousness and the appetite um, as, you know, the other two parts. And, and, and in a sense, those are really the two parts most people are familiar with, right? We think of, right, reason and appetite and the sort of, you know, the struggle to rightly order those things. And I wonder if it would be helpful just to speak a little bit both in terms of Platonic psychology about the right operation of the relationship between these three parts of the soul, right? Um, so how, how, how does Plato conceive of them as functioning well? And then, and then related to that, how also might we conceive of them as functioning well socially, um, right? Be, or being expressed well socially? Because I, my, my guess is that'll help us understand the extent to which um, the, you know, the, what, what I take to be a, a premise of your, you know, your approach is that thumos in our culture is a, a particular kind of angle on things that have gone wrong, right? The w- ways things have, you know, become askew. And it might be helpful just to have a sense of well, what it looks like, at least ideally, for them to be working well, both again, at the level of the of sort of, you know, psychology, right? The, you know, the psychology of the individual or the person, and then also at the level of the social. Is that, a, is that an okay, you know, kind of taking us back and then getting a couple of things out there that maybe you can focus, uh, that, you know? That, some of these that's, uh, okay, no, okay, sorry. My, I thought I was gonna have to switch to my phone, but in fact, finally, this, my, my dinosaur technology is kind of, awakened to life so excuse adrian, me for- adrian i've just conceived of all of this as a kind of your own sort of thumatic expression um throughout you know our conversation you know the assertion of self-command you know uh, it's, it's, it's more talking. neurotic than thumatic i'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> man but it actually it, it, so, I, I, forgive me for this anyway that's that- so what do you think mark can you uh, uh yeah so i'll try to um I'll try to answer obviously that briefly. Everyone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, in terms of the the, the order in the soul, right? In, in the Republic, uh, we get an account of that um, in terms of uh, <clears throat> the uh, you know the 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 task of reason, right? Is to uh, to recognize the good, right? What is truly good, and the distinction between true and apparent goods. Uh, and uh, and to um, to judge the proper order of goods, which uh, you know have, there are certain absolute elements to that and certain contingent elements to that, right? Uh, <clears throat> the role of thumos is to attach itself to the good recognized by reason as the good to be uh, pursued. Right? And uh, and the role of the appetites uh, are um, to you know remind us <laughs> basically that we're uh, you know that we're living animals, um, and uh, but to uh, to be sort of put uh, to to be kept in their place right, uh, in relation to the goods that are acknowledged by reason and and committed to by thumos. Right? Um, and, and of course, he you know sets a, a parallel with the well-ordered city in those terms. Now, uh, very briefly, it's it's helpful to understand uh, as he goes down the the other types of regimes what the corresponding soul orderings and disorderings are, right? So the next regime is the honor-loving regime where Thumas is dominant, right? <clears throat> uh, where um, you know it's kind of uh, kind of a version of what Hobbes is caricaturing, where um, you know you the the lovers of, of of rule and victory and honor just kind of um 
roll over everyone else, right? Um, <clears throat> or at least they're the dominant type. Uh, and as he goes down this, these regimes, they're increasingly disorderly. Uh, and so the next, and particularly, uh, the next two are particularly important for understanding our own uh, situation, I think, right? The oligarchic soul yeah. is the one that uh, subordinates unnecessary appetites to the necessary appetites for the sake of accumulation and the status that comes with the, the wealth being the dominant principle in the oligarchic regime, right? Um, <clears throat> and so love of wealth is a, is a kind of love of honor, but love of honor within the parameters of that kind of regime. And this, is, uh, this has all kinds of uh, resonances, just, you know, first, uh, first out of the box is, um, you know, Max Weber's account of the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism, which is basically saying, what we're looking at is oligarchically ordered souls. And there's something in these particular kinds of Protestantism that are about delayed gratification and, and so on, right? That, um, that fit with that oligarchic soul ordering. And partly uh, this is connected to a kind of moralism that you often see in, uh, in these Protestant traditions, right? Um, <clears throat> that, uh, that there's the, the notion of dignity is very much bound up with that kind of worldly asceticism as, uh, as Faber describes it. Right? Uh, and then you have the uh, democratic soul, which is you know, the soul of the 1960s basically, right? Um, that all, all appetites are, are uh, equally good and no one should be shamed for, uh, for what they happen to prioritize that doesn't happen to be what other people prioritize. Right? Uh, and, this, and the confrontation between these, these two orderings of soul is, I think, brilliantly captured in, uh, in, one, in a great scene from The Big Lebowski, <laughs> where, uh, where the hippie Lebowski is talking to the businessman Lebowski, right? And uh, the businessman Lebowski says, Mr. Lebowski, the bums lost. <laughs> um, which is to say, those who, right? If you if you don't prioritize, uh, you know, self command for the sake of accumulation, then you're going to be a bum. Right? Um, <clears throat> uh, so that uh, in in terms of the different ways the souls ordered, right, I think a lot of what we see as a kind of you know, one substructure of what we call a sort of culture war in America is really a conflict that's, that in some sense is implicitly internal to liberalism, right? <clears throat> Between the oligarchic soul and the democratic soul, right? And liberalism to function has to, in many ways, favor the oligarchic soul, but always leaves itself open to the protest uh, against that, you know, those rigors by the democratic soul. And there's a super, super brief point about the, uh, the social, a very important part of the social management and social uh, harmonization of the various forms of thematic is manners, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that is a, a kind of, there is a certain kind of ritualized or codified ways of expressing respect of not offending others, right? And, um, and in a certain sense, it's the dissolution of manners for the sake of uh, a kind of um, protest, uh, victimological imposition of forms of respect and non-offense, right? That's, that is also uh, one of the problems that we're dealing with. Great, thank you. Um, and Adrian and Matt, I wanna open this up to you guys and also remind everybody, just type your questions into the Q and A box. Um, we've all, we're already getting some, and we'd love to you know we'd love to raise your questions too. Matt, did you want to jump in? I had one thought, but you, why don't you go ahead? Uh, you, <clears throat> yeah, you go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, well, I was just uh, thinking about uh, as as Mark was was talking about uh, the role of the thumotic in in Plato. I was thinking about. Um, C.S. Lewis's uh, discussion of the chest, you know, in chapter one of the abolition of man. That's what I was going to talk about. Oh, <laughs> okay. you, go, you go ahead. You, no, you, go, you ahead. go ahead. Okay. Um, so, uh, 
this is I'm speaking as a man with a very flabby chest here. So you got you need some support. But um, the, the the two the two points that I think Lewis helps us see in in the, the sort of platonic account um, are first that the thumatic is a kind of mediator between reason and the 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 the, the desiring uh, appetites, right? The 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 concupiscible appetites. Um, it, it seems on the one hand, so an, an mediator typically sort of has a foot in both of the realities between which he mediates or it mediates. And, and in this case, right, it, it's not that the thumatic just is reason. It, it, it seems to partake of the the emotional life of man, the, the sort of passional life of man. On the other hand, uh, it does, it, at least in a, in a sort of properly brought up person in a, in a virtuous man, uh, the, the thumas has a, the thumatic does have a, a sort of executive role. It, it, it uh, helps reason execute its commands and, and even in a way uh, keeps the command of reason from being merely sort of verbal and nominal and ineffectual. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is, I mean, related to the, the mediating role of the thumatic is the, the point that Matt was making a few minutes ago about the evaluative character of the thumatic. Because, right, you could, you could think of the um, concupiscible appetites or the, the concupiscible part of the soul uh, as characterized by sort of immediacy, right? The concupiscible part just sort of goes for what it wants and what it needs. Whereas the, at least in some of its functions, the thumatic part um, seems to incorporate something almost analogous to a sort of second order reflection to a standing back or a, a sort of recoil vis-a-vis um, -vis, uh, that immediacy, right? Um, and, and so, the, 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 so having, having, having highlighted those two points, I just wanna end with one sort of thought for further consideration, which is that, um, and this is, I think, something that, again, C.S. Lewis does a good job of, of, of highlighting, that in, in a sort of well-ordered person, the, the thumatic wouldn't simply, it, it, it wouldn't simply be um, a sort of external tool of reason vis-a-vis -vis the other forms of appetite. Um, it, it would it, it would it would in itself be a kind of incarnation of the judgment of reason, and looked at from that point of view, it could even it could even lead as well as follow. And the, the image that came to mind recently for me was the sort of well trained sheepdog uh, that seems to be just where it needs to be before almost before the 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 shepherd. Um, it commands it to be there, uh, that there's a kind of, so yeah, I'll just, I'll just stop there, but that's, that, those are a couple of, of, of further thoughts. Yeah. And so, so Mark gave us the, uh, the kind of first order, um, approximation, I guess, from the Platonic account that reason identifies the good and Thumos sort of provides a motive force toward it or attaches us to it. Yeah. Um, and then in C.S. Lewis, it's, um, it's a little more, um, what do you call it, you know, over time, a developmental account where he talks about yeah. the training of the affections. Right. So this, I think the, um, the, the thematic part of the soul is trained up in right judgment, one hopes, with, the, with a good education and I, to identify 
um, sort of proper objects of admiration and of contempt, um, praise and blame, shame and pride. And then once that training has happened, the reasoning reason is relieved of the burden of constantly operating. And Adrian, you talked about a, a kind of a purely verbal, you know, kind of analysis of the good is is so um, ineffective, right? As a as a guide to to living yeah. well, yeah, rightly. Um, I also want to so. You guys probably uh, have, have heard of this guy, Josh Mitchell, who's been critiquing identity politics. And this is to get back to Mark's um, victimology theme. And he's offered um, uh, a sort of binary of a politics of victimhood and a politics of competence. And that um, there's sort of the aspiration to competence and self-reliance, I think, can be um, associated with Thumas um, because among the objects that Thumas evaluates is oneself. So obviously that it's connected to a sense of self-worth and um, the kind of therapeutic state and its victimological um, manifestations also require a very different sense of oneself as as incompetent and and fragile. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if, if that second thought gears in somehow to the C.S. Lewis thought about the training of the affections, but it does seem like we're training people into a learned helplessness that is valorized, right, as a kind of proper self consciousness. Yeah. Um, and anyone who kind of rejects that, you know that's suspicious as maybe a sort of toxic masculinity or something, because this is somewhat gendered, I think. So the whole sexual holy war against the male um, can be understood perhaps as a manifestation of this Hobbesian um, yeah. long, long game of suppressing pride for the sake of making people more easily administratable or something in the, in the therapeutic state. Can I just uh, two quick things? And I, 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 is that all right, Joe? Just two quick things. So, yeah. As so, so the one point, Matt, that was really nicely stated, right? That that re reason is sort of relieved of the burden of having to ratiocinate all the time. Um, and a thought that occurred to me when you said that was is that there's something. Of, it, it's sort of like reason is made to indwell. Thumas, and and then you know through and with Thumas also the other appetites, sort of in the way that um, Polanyi says that uh, yeah. the the agent is supposed to indwell his tools, right? Um, so that's one point. And then the second point, yeah, I I I think that that tie in with with competence, which of course is also related to the theme of self command that which uh, Mark was talking about at the beginning is, is really, really important because again, one of the, it seems to me, one of the functions of the thumatic uh, is to sort of help the other appetites, the other sorts of appetites for their own good. Um, uh, sort of go beyond their own immediacy and and become sort of obedient to uh, a sort of integrated pursuit of the good and it's just the case i think that that integrated pursuit of the good goes together with um not only self-command and, and competence but also having a self that's actually Forgive me for talking so much about C.S. Lewis, but I just taught this book to my students a, a few weeks ago, and I, I think I finally understood it and, and saw how profound it is. But in a way that what he's saying in, in the third chapter of the book, um, which is about, which is a sort of reductio ad absurdum of the idea that we could master nature, we should try to master nature, is that 
um, without the, the sort of thumatic integration of the, of the other appetites at the, at the service of reason, there actually is no self. Um, there's just a kind of, of uh, epiphenomenon of the, the pushing and pulling of, 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 disordered, of disordered and blind appetites. Joe, can I, I want to respond to one of the Q&A questions by piggybacking on both these last two points. Um, that's all right. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, no problem. Uh, am I on? I can't remember. Yes, we hear you. Yes. Yeah, great. Um, yeah. Which question is it? Why don't you just read the question, Mark? Um, uh, yeah, the question is from Michael Gorman. And yeah, I was going to go there too. Good. Yeah, right. <laughs> How often does Thumas get co-opted by appetite with the result that we present ourselves to others and to ourselves as manly and thematic when really we're just trying to get what we want contrary to reason? Can I'm so manly be a way to put a good face on the fact that the really I'm just a teenager? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, and I think, no, this is directly as, as Joe and I both uh, see, it's, it's direct, immediately uh, connected to, uh, to Adrian's point about immediacy and immediate um, desire, yeah. right? That is to say that the integrated pursuit of the good involves, uh, uh, well, and to connect with Matthew's, Matt's point, a uh, kind of self-command, right? Self-possession um, and, uh, and an exercise of judgment on uh, behalf of, again, standards of respect and um, and particularly implicitly, right, a, a kind of uh, friendship based on virtue, right? That is a, a concern for the uh, the, the well being, uh, morally, spiritually, etc., of the other, and uh, and so um, it's often the case that. Um, the, the sort of rebellious uh, response to any kind of constraint presents itself as manly because it is thematic, right? Um, that is to say, uh, there, there is something that you could call toxic manliness, um, masculinity, right? Which is precisely the kind of, you know, uh, I want what I want, you're gonna give it to me um, because, I, because I'm gonna, you know, take it uh, kind of um, attitude, which, yeah, which can, um, <clears throat> can sort of persuade itself that I'm just not going to listen, put up with anyone else's, you know, telling me what to do kind of position, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not an integrated, uh, it's not a, um, it's not a sort of self, um, self possession, really. Yeah, no, but that, that's right. That's, then that's what I was going to pick up on as well. And I'm glad you brought up Michael's question. So since we're doing that, since we're looking at other questions, um, uh, why don't we turn to a couple of those? I want to go to uh, one of the earlier questions that was asked. Um, it was Mark. It was really for you. Um, and I think more your opening comments. It says, this is uh, Patrick Jones. Um, could you right. say more? Yeah, could you say more? Hi, about this? What was that? Hi, Pat. Is what you just said? Hi, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Could you say more about precisely what characteristics of the Pascal vic uh, victimology provoke the thematic responses of the early modern secular victimologists? What are the political reasons for attempting to overturn uh, Pascal victimology in favor of secularized versions? Uh, and, and that's a great question. I think it was, I had a question similar to that uh, at the beginning as you were presenting yours, but, but Patrick's done a really good job of sort of summing that up. Um, so what do you think, Mark? Um, well, I mean, there's an easy answer to that question, which, you know, may not be an adequate answer, but, um, uh, and it's probably, you know, partly what Patrick has in the back of his mind as well, because uh, I know he's, he knows uh, Pierre Menon's work very well, mm -hmm. uh, that, um, that uh, in, in both Machiavelli and Hobbes, Right, this uh, this um, appropriation, in a certain sense, of um, of the the victim sympathy that the church has cultivated uh, <clears throat> becomes a way of um, of sort of learning <laughs> learning from the church and uh, adapting 
something that gives it a kind of um, moral vision and moral authority to uh, to s sort of legitimate a separate secular political sphere that the church is sort of kept out of, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think this, you know, it's, it's, it's in certain ways it's very easy to make this case in Hobbes, right? Because that's what Hobbes is all about, right? Hobbes is all about the, uh, you know, the problem uh, that Christianity makes us see double, as he says, right? Makes us <clears throat> sort of behold into two entirely different mm -hmm. authorities at the same time, right? And he's trying to, um, to eminentize, as it were, right? Uh, that, uh, <clears throat> all of that into one, right? Into one, one authority. Uh, and and it's the political it's the secularized political um, principles that are giving that authority its mm -hmm. parameters and shape. Right? And so I guess so I give it a um, <clears throat> a kind of broader uh, um, broader brush stroke, and this will pick up on some things that Matt's been saying. Uh, I think there's a sense in which Hobbes uh, recognizes that um, that possibility and in a certain sense destiny, if you will, right, for the modern state to be to tend toward what we could describe as a totalitarian character, right? Uh, an all-encompassing authority. Uh, and I think what um, what we see in the again, the properly speaking liberal tradition of people like, uh, you know, Locke and civic Republicans and you know, uh, various kinds of Rousseauan uh, forms is precisely a kind of uh, a, a, a resuscitation, a re reinvigoration of Thumos for the sake of finding some way to push back or put some brakes on the, that overarching tendency of the modern mm -hmm. state. And, and if that account uh, is plausible, then um, uh, you know, we can understand our own moment as um, possibly right, as, a, as a time in which those breaks and those alternatives are um, in some ways playing themselves out to exhaustion, in other ways taking forms that are just destabilizing. Right. Adrian, do you want it? Yeah, well, so I'm not going to pretend to give a sort of genetic account, um, but just maybe as a sort of hypothesis about one of the functions that this secularization of victimology plays would be to say that, um, you know, once once Christianity comes on the scene, um, it becomes clear that there could be a, a radical solution once and for all to the problem of evil. Um, but then once you get to the point where it looks like the church or Christianity has sort of betrayed that or that it doesn't it doesn't sort of work on its own terms it might be tempting to take the idea of um, dealing with evil let's just say dealing with the problem of evil once and for all and turning it into a, a kind of technology I mean this is something that actually uh, Mark and Matt and I have texted a little bit about recently uh, so as, as I say, I'm not I'm not pretending to give a, a sort of genetic account, but just that uh, that's just a hypothesis about about one of the functions, right? That that it's a way of um, sort of I'm, I'm not going to say getting rid of evil once and for all. That wouldn't be the point, but it would be uh, it would be a, a way of dealing with it. Um, with a kind of definitiveness because you, you'd, you discovered a, a way of acknowledging the fact that you can't get rid of it, but then using it um, as a kind of, um, you know, and this is a point that for me has really emerged re reading Mark's stuff, uh, that um, the, the sort of 
resentment and channeling over evil and the, and the resent and the channeling of that resentment become a kind of fake common good um, yeah. that can be used for a sort of social or political technology. I mean, that, again, that's just a hypothesis about, about the function. Yeah, just a quick question, Adrian, there. You use the language of evil, which we haven't really used before. At this point, are you using that as synonymous for like that kind of uh, the, the, the disorder of the soul that and that the tech, the technological response here is is more or less the Hobbesian or the the liberal liberal theoretical political attempt to order things in such a way as to solve this disorder therapeutically or you know by virtue of standards. yeah it could be it, right it could be the disorder of the soul it it could be um, just the the, the suffering, the physical suffering that's in the world, it could just okay, be human. Okay, so much wickedness. broader. Okay, so much it could broader. be human wickedness, but but I mean, it could be any one or all all three. But okay. um, it, it's really this attempt to kind of master. Anyway, you, you get the okay. point. Edit. Okay, yeah. So let me turn to another question. This one is really practical. Okay, and I think it's a it, it's a fair question to ask. Um, and maybe we're the, we're exactly the wrong people to ask a very practical question. But nonetheless, I think it's a, you know it's a good question and a fair question to bring up. So um, the the question comes from Sarah Sullivan, who asks: We have three uh, young adult children, uh, ages 21 through 25. How do you all talk to young adults about possibly where we are going as a country in terms of political organization? I.e., it seems such a hopeless time for American government. So it's, uh, presumably, a lot of what provokes what we're now discuss discussing is your sense that the, the thumatic gives a window into some of this hopelessness, um, the political hopelessness that Sarah is describing. So some of you may have children, right? Like how, do you, how do you deal with this kind of stuff in the way Sarah asks? It's a great question. Hmm. Anyone want to jump in? Matt, you want to give it? I want to give Matt the first pass at that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have Matt, some things to tell you. Boy, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't really have any practical advice, but um, it does seem like some of the despair that people feel might be tied to a sense that, um, well, depending on your sort of intersectional, you know, um, identity, you may not have standing to um, to express. Uh, that kind of self-regard and self-assertion in the in the public square. So I, th I think it was Harvey Mansfield said, um, "You can tell a lot about a society by um, considering who is allowed to get angry." And so I think with identity politics. Um, you know, and, and a kind of moral typology of citizens. Um, many people feel they don't have standing to, um, for a kind of self-assertion publicly. And, and that is, there's a kind of, I mean, obviously a kind of program of demoralization in the schools with the critical race theory and such. And I think it's, you know, that can be quite effective at, um, feeling like it doesn't, you don't really have a place or that it's not your, um, it's not your country. So, I mean, um, what am I trying to say? I guess. Well, if I don't, could, can I interject? Yeah. Real quick and just ask you, like to, to what extent then is the way you're speaking not itself another version of victimology, right? Like, yeah, like, right, is, right. And what, is that a, yeah, and is that, is that, is, is it almost like it's, I mean, to use Sarah's word, is it almost like hopeless? You're kind of trapped in this logic of, of victimology where you, the only way you can describe yes. this in terms of your own victimization, right? Right. There's a great temptation to then re, right, regard oneself as victim. And then, of course, yeah. this becomes the basis of the sort of right wing identity politics. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Um, and then we're, we're kind of all trapped. We're kind of just like, you know. Yeah. It's just, it's going to polarize more and more perhaps, or, you know, we, we find ourselves incapable of offering an alternative description of, uh, you know, what, you know, the way to think about things. Yeah. I think it was Trotsky who, who said, you may not be interested in war, but <laughs> war is interested in you. <laughs> right. Um, right. So, 
yeah, here <laughs> we find ourselves in this logic um, of of the moral typology of citizens that was that has been sort of constructed through, um, well, going way back um, to the you know the whole concept of protected classes and and all that and in, in civil rights law. And it seems to be working itself out now in, in political culture. It has for a long time been part of, of law and you know the kind of administrative um, regime. Mm. So yeah, so one one way I think this manifests, uh, so I have two girls in in middle school. Um, actually one is in middle school now, and it is a it's a minority of girls and, and I talk to other parents who are in different schools and, and even different um, you know different states and such and minority is full sexual at this point and there's of course a whole menu of, of sexual options and I, I wonder if some of that is a kind of uh, affiliate one wants to affiliate with some kind of Thing as um, is not being under a kind of cloud of suspicion, right? You don't, one doesn't want to be a Karen, and that's one way to kind of find a an affiliation that will save one from disapprobation. Maybe. So, mm -hmm. Sorry to bring it down to politics, yeah. but um, no, no. I mean, Sarah certainly is asking for this kind of analysis. Mark, jump in. Yeah. Um, uh, I might be able to circle back to that, but I want to connect some thoughts back to Adrian's uh, point uh, just before um, that, you know, the, the, uh, I think, you know, you're right, Joe, to, uh, to home in on the, the hope and despair problem, right? That, um, and I think, so one of the ways I've been thinking about this, especially um, in the past few days is in terms of um, all right. One of the one of the things that's new in uh, in the kind of modern secularization uh, is idolatry takes a different form than in antiquity. Right. Uh, so Augustine has this great critique of idolatry, the great Christian Christian critique of idolatry that you know this sort of love of dominion. Right. There, there's a kind of straightforwardness to um, to the the sort of thematic glory loving dominion loving character of of uh, idolatry in the ancient world, right? And Christianity kind of explodes that in to the extent that it's culturally effective, right? Uh, captures our imagination and sensibilities. But um, <clears throat> but what uh, the modern forms of idolatry do is take over the elements of the Christian vision. So um, <clears throat> so the um, <clears throat> so, you know, as Eric Bogelin has, has described very well, right, the eminentized uh, eschaton, right, the, the, and this is kind of part of what Adrian's getting at, right, the final, final solution to use, you know, the horrifying term, um, that heaven, heaven on earth, right, very clear in Marxist thought. Um, but what I'm adding to that, I think, is um, what Adrian has described well, what what it, what we see in Hobbes is a kind of technocratic securitarianism, right? right. Uh, and what this what this involves, uh, I like to think of this in terms of right the the theological virtues become part of the menu of virtues right, with Christianity, uh, and then these modern political idolatries um uh, kind of co-opt them and and uh and transform them right and hope in particular and this is this is getting to the practical point where i you know i how i talk to my 23 and 17 year olds um and my students right uh that hope becomes transformed into optimism right? and all of our hope is placed in large institutions and not in the Right, the moral action of one's own doings, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we want those larger institutions to solve the problems for us, right? And the, you know, we want the market to do it, right? We want the state to do it. We want the global 
whatever to do it, right? World Health Organization, right? Um, and um, and that comes with a faith, which is a faith in history and progress. Uh, and, uh, and I'll talk about love in a minute because this gets back to Matt. But, um, <clears throat> but what I try to get across is that these are misplaced hopes, right? And this is how, we're, how we are formed to, to uh, direct our hopes and our, you know, the imagination of you know, our, our worship, basically, right? Our idolatry um, in you know, faith in humanity. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> And, uh, and, you know, we're going to find the solution as, you know, the human race, which right, humanity is not an agent, right? um, but it's a mythical being that is an agent in the imagination. Right? Um, and so, and that's, that's optimism, right? And, and what I try to argue is that optimism is ultimately nihilistic, right? Whereas hope is about the good and my personal relationship to the drama of, the good in my life. And ultimately, if you're a Christian, right, my, uh, my attempt to recognize and fulfill my, my vocation. Um, and then, you know, the distorted form of love is, well, basically exactly what Matt's talking about, right? The, the Rousseau and compassion on behalf of that, of that victim that, you know, my, I prove my love for that victim by telling you how bad you are being complicit in the suffering of that victim and thereby establish my own goodwill and virtue by doing that, right? So it's really, really deeply distorted version of love. Right? Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have just a few more minutes left. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna take two more questions uh, for you guys. I'll. I'll direct them. The second one, uh, we'll just start with you, Adrian. Uh, this, okay. is Jessica, this is Jessica Jones's question. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, another friend of the IHEs. Um, it seems like uh, since thumos is necessary for bringing about prudential action, that is reason cognizing the good wouldn't be enough for action. In the political sphere, it'd be necessary for the leader to persuade citizens not only via reason, but also through appeals to thumos. Could the could, the, could you, Adrian, begin by uh, be, or help us out by speaking more about how our capacity for persuasive appeals has been affected with the misdirection of Thumos in modern political life? Okay, and what a wide, what a wise persuasion of Thumos would look like. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't have anything to say about the first part of the question off the top of my head. I mean, um, I think that the you guys would, would be a lot better on that than I would. Um, but the, the second part, uh, that, well, I mean, the, first of all, those are, both parts are outstanding. Um, um, and, and both would, I think, probably require a lot of reflection. But in terms of the second part, I mean, just choosing one element of, of many that would have to go into a kind of, you know, to a response to the question. Um, uh, th there would have to be a right ordering between um, sort of, let's say, anger or the love of glory um, on the one hand and uh, a kind of obedience to the good on the other kind of loving obedience to the good on the other. And um, the, the leader would have, to, would have to sort of embody that in order to be able to get it more or less right. Um, so, I mean, in terms of, of what, this would, what that would look like sort of technically, I don't know. I mean, again, that would, that would require a lot of reflection, but it just seems to me that, again, for, for me, one of the big one of the important sort of issues at stake in this whole discussion is that of recovering the thumatic. So there is something about the love of glory. There is something about sort of righteous indignation that's, that's not bad and that uh, shouldn't just be dismissed out of court. Um, but, but it does, it does have to be sort of subordinated 
not just verbally, but also in terms of the, the training of the soul that which Matt was talking about earlier um, to uh, love of the love of the beautiful. And it seems to me that you, you know, part of that training, I mean, fortunately, we don't have to start, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to start from scratch each time. There's a, there's a tradition of, of sort of excellent integration. Um, I mean, not only in the sense, not only on the literary level, but also, you know, in our own lives. I mean, there are all kinds of, there, there's still all kinds of exemplars. I mean, known and, you know, less known um, people that we've encountered probably in our own lives um, who can kind of initiate us into that. But that, that's really what it gets down to, I think. And then the, the technical part of it, I mean, the elaboration of that w would in part be a kind of prudential matter precisely, but you, you couldn't get that right without at least the beginnings of, of a kind of, you know, integration of the thematic with, you know, love of the, the true, obedient love of the good. Yeah, can, Adrian, just to follow up on, um, on, on your, your points there. Um, earlier you talked, you, when you first intervened, you talked about the danger of the thematic. And yeah. then you said, right, you said, look, despite like, let's say like dangers associated with Thumos, nonetheless, there, there is something legitimate about it. And you pointed to Christ. And I think you pointed to the gospel of John yeah. at that point, right? Yeah. Um, you know, a kind of, there's a kind of genuine thematic here that actually might, you know, that, that can be a model for us. And so now you yeah. use, used right now, for instance, the language of glory, right? And the love of yeah. glory, I think was the term you used. Now there's a dangerous, right, associated with loving glory. Sure. Okay, and then there's glory adequately revered, yes. or however you want to put it. Um, that seems to be, you know, something that is quite practical in terms of Je Jessica's question, right? That sure. you can appeal to a kind of genuine um, regard for glory, right? I mean, it's just, this is what you're saying, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make. Yeah, sure. and it's just that it's just that the. Um, Thumas is like the loyal retainer, you know, I mean, um, who's looking for somebody who's every inch the king. And the, you, you, can, you only can be every inch the king uh, if um, you actually, in a certain sense, have died to any consideration other than the common good. Yeah. And then once you do that, you get everything back again. It's not that you just become a kind of cipher or a sort of anonymous function, but um, that's ultimately, I think, at least one of the sources of what we call legitimacy. And, and that's what Sumas is looking for. And, if, and, and a proper respect for it would be to give it what it's looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, Matt, you want to in on this? One? Yeah, um, that was beautiful, Adrian. Um, and uh, it occurs to me that we do have a kind of historical example of, of what you're talking about. I'm thinking of the early civil rights movement. Mm. Um, so this was a spirited um, mm -hmm. appeal to, is it a patriotic appeal to the common birthright of citizenship? Uh, as against the local sham democracy of the South. So it's very much the language of, of the common good um, and common status as citizens. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, it took on a very different cast later, but, um, and so there's, there's a kind of resplendent um, quality to that. And so, yeah, I don't know, I guess, one could highlight that such moments and try to understand them. Yeah. Um, how how things you know yeah. and took a different turn with a more you know the, the language of the common good seemed to drop out. Yeah. Um, I know. It just. Mark. Yeah, if I could add a quick point to that, because this gets back to something I wanted to get back to a long time ago, which uh, is uh, Adrian and in his initial remarks. Um, 
uh, and 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 continually in his uh, interventions has um, has talked about the 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 problem in a sense of a a properly Christian account yeah. of the thematic and an understanding yeah. of its place and and certainly that's a key aspect of you know the early civil rights movement whereas the later civil rights movement becomes again a kind of secularized uh, discourse right about culture and economics and politics. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so just two kind of quick observations about that. Uh, one is this, um, the, the, the discourses, the sort of modern uh, reappropriations of Thumos uh, up to this point uh, have, have operated with caricatured accounts of Christianity and the Christian tradition, right? Mm -hmm. So you've got on the one hand, uh, the uh, Hegel and Fukuyama account in which Christianity is basically reduced to, you know, Kantian moral agency, right? That's kind of what Christianity is all about, right? Um, you, you hear that again and again in Fukuyama, especially. <clears throat> um, and then you have, you know, Nietzsche's uh, psychology of will to power and resentment, particularly, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and ascetic, um, you know, uh, unmanliness and so on, right? Which, um, which uh, I've just started into Peter Sloterdijk's book on this topic, which is very, very mm. interesting. In fact, um, mm. very much uh, explicitly trying to reappropriate the Platonic psychology of Thumos, um, but in a very Nietzschean vein, right? Mm. <clears throat> Where uh, again, it's uh, Christianity you know, has no positive role to play in this whatsoever. It's just a, a bad detour. Um, and, uh, and so the thing that I left out in my, uh, in my, you know, sort of uh, Lenten Easter uh, vision at the outset, of course, was the resurrection. Yeah. And, uh, and just, I'll just throw out this thought. I've talked about this particularly with Adrian before that, um, that it's wrong. It's the, one of the big one of the big mistakes is to think of the resurrection as establishing this otherworldly existence as a as a fact, right? Because the resurrection is nothing like afterlife myths that existed before, right? It's not a there's this life and then there's that life. It changes the meaning of death, and this is a this is a lot of what's at issue in in some of Matt's uh, earlier remarks too about right the why do we want to uh, why are we ready to sort of toss the, the status of the moral agent? Well, because we don't have a realistic, mature uh, way of dealing with suffering and death. Yeah. yeah. And that, that's what a, a healthy thematic uh, disposition yeah. has to have. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, that's uh, properly understood the doctrine of the resurrection uh, as a at, right as a as not the sort of um, dividing line between life and afterlife, but as a threshold in a continuous life, right, which has continuous ends, right, that one is pursuing all along the way, right. Uh, this gives us this beautiful word in the New Testament, macrothumia, right, which gets. I think badly translated as long, long suffering, right? Um, it's not about suffering. It's about thumos. It's about doing, right? It's about my sense of agency is extended yes. even, even beyond my death, right? Because that's just a threshold in this drama that yeah. in which the ends that I'm acting for themselves are extending through and beyond death itself, right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and I mean, there, there's because there, there really are. So. So. Right. So it's the, the, the whole Paschal mystery, cross and resurrection is a kind of hyperbolic fulfillment all, among, among all the other magnificent things it is of the thumatic. And, and what you're saying kind of puts me in mind of uh, the sort of constitution of, of glory, because um, there's sort of two distinct but inseparable parts, it seems to me, to glory. And, and one of them is that you appear um, and uh, 
the, the appearing has to do with a kind of liberality, a kind of magnanimity, and a kind of fruitfulness, right? Um, but the other part is that uh, there's something worth doing. <laughs> there's some good that's worth serving. Um, and so, so, so that it isn't just a kind of, that's precisely why the, the, the appearing um, can be a good in its own right, rather than a sort of empty show, because it's intimately tied up with exactly a liberal magnanimous going beyond the self in, in service of something grand, of something magnificent, of something better. And it just seems to me that, that there's something about the, the death and resurrection of Christ, which does that in a, in a, with a kind of unimaginable fullness, really, and, and precisely in part for the reasons that, Mark, you were just laying out. Well, um, I said we would take two more questions. That was only one. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and, and if you know, if you know Adrian as well as I do, you can tell Adrian's just getting warmed up. Right? No, no, I mean, I don't, no, no, because I, I actually have a faculty meeting in about a half hour, so yeah, so, so I, I need, right, I need to warm yeah. down. We have time for one more question in the next half hour. <laughs> well, I think we should end here. As uh, you know, I've been given the advice that it's good to leave people a little hungry rather than a little bit overstuffed. Right. Um, you can see that there's a lot here that's left, and my guess is we're going to do this again um, down the line. Uh, you know, there there are countless directions this kind of conversation can be taken in, and other people to bring into the conversation. I'm deep, deeply grateful for everybody who hung on, and, mo and, and the vast majority of the, the people who joined us today hung on right to this moment. So again, thank you so, so much. Um, thank you, Mark, Matthew, and Adrian for joining us this afternoon. I think this was a really fruitful um, yeah. you know, first entry into this conversation. On behalf of us at the uh, Institute for Human Ecology, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. Have a good rest of your day and a good Easter. I mean, excuse me, a good Lent and Easter. Um, thank you bye guys. And your, bye, your, bye guys. Your logistical support people, thanks to all of you. Yes, yeah. they're, they're, they're a good team. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.